The following is a presentation of Bismarck State College. Distinguished scholar of the Humanities Lecture Series. Um, for those of you that are new to our series, just a couple of opening comments. Uh, from the outset, uh, Clay and I had talked about this was going to be an experiment, and so we're continuing to experiment. And uh, I had uh, approached Clay about uh, giving a lecture series up here at the college, and uh, by golly, he would only agree to it if I sat on the stage with him, you know, so here I am. And it's working out okay. We're having a lot of fun doing this, I can tell you that. And so... Can I just um, say, it wasn't just sitting on the stage. <laughs> it was the idea of a conversation oh. between the witty and learned president of Bismarck State and... Oh, is that it? Oh. And I thought you needed somebody good looking on the stage with you. <laughs> Is that, <laughs> that was my first hope, but then I chose you. <laughs> He's too quick for me. He's too quick. <laughs> could we bring the lights back up a little on, on the audience? Sir? No, truly, could we have a little more light on the audience? Okay. There we go. Thank there, you. Thank you. So, but I wanted the idea. The idea was conversation, because not everyone knows that you are a very serious reader, and that you are a historian and published books in history, and that you are widely curious about the world. And so that's, I mean, not, not all college presidents have that interest. Oh, well, well, thank you for saying that. So I I'm, wanted you on stage. I'm supposed to be introducing you oh, tonight. Sorry. So. I'm just defending from this notion <laughs> that I, I needed like a body on stage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, I think everybody got the point. Now. Yeah, good. Okay. <laughs> So, it is my privilege now to introduce uh, Mr. Clay Jenkinson, Bismarck State College Distinguished Scholar of the Humanities. Clay is a Rhodes Scholar and a Danforth Scholar, is a published author and one of the leading public humanities scholars in the United States. He hosts a nationally syndicated ro ro rodeo, radio program <laughs> from Bismarck, the Thomas Jefferson Hour, and works as a speaker, consultant, and facilitator. Clay was a major contributor to Ken Burns' uh, public television series, Jefferson, and has portrayed Jefferson in 49 states before the Supreme Court, the President, state legislatures, and countless audiences, as well as the Today Show, Politically Incorrect, and CNN. <coughs> Clay co-founded the modern and Chautauqua movement with the late Everett Elbers. He is currently director of the Dakota Institute through <coughs> the Fort Mandan Foundation, chief consultant to the Theodore Roosevelt Center through Dickinson State University and a columnist for the Bismarck Tribune. He has an MA from Oxford University, England, a BA in English Literature from Vanderbilt University, and a BA in English from the University of Minnesota. So please welcome Mr. Clay Jenkinson. Um, before we get into tonight's uh, lecture series uh, discussion, which is about uh, Eric Severide William Shirer. Shirer. Got Shirer. 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 And the invention of broadcast news. Uh, I would like to ask Clay to talk a little bit. Our next uh, presentation will be on Wednesday, March 11th, and the title of it is Sir Richard Francis Burton and the Source of the Nile. And so if you're like me, you have no idea who this guy is, uh, Sir Richard Francis Burton. So if you'd tell us a little bit about that one, that would be great. Well, I wanted, we, we set up these lectures. I wanted just to explore lots of different topics to, uh, just for the fun of it. Uh, but Sir Richard Francis Burton was even in his own time called the most interesting of all Victorian people. He knew 29 languages. Think of that. He knew 29 languages, including Latin and Greek, uh, many modern European languages, Hindustani, Farsi, Arabic, it goes on and on and on. He knew Arabic so well, Larry, that he infiltrated Mecca when it was death for an infidel to go to Mecca. He went disguised as a Sunni Arab, and he was able to pass as an authentic Sunni Arab at Mecca, and he came back and wrote a famous two-volume account of it. He wrote 40 books. He was one of the great bayonet artists and fence, fencing artists of the world. 
he, in late in life, he translated 1001 Arabian Nights. His translation is still regarded as the most authentic. It's not the most widely read, but the most authentic of 1001 Arabian Nights. He discovered and translated the Kama Sutra. He went to Salt Lake City to see what this new American polygamous cult uh, Mormonism was all about. Uh, he was a, a British uh, soldier in the Crimean War. He was in India where he infiltrated on behalf of Napier the male brothels to bring back an investigative report about British officers and male prostitutes in India. Uh, this was one of the most extraordinary men who ever lived in the world. And among all the other things that he did, he searched for the source of the Nile. And he and, and this lieutenant he hired, a man named Speak, went from the East African coast to try to find the source of the Nile. And they, this was before antibiotics, and they had one of the largest safaris up till that time. And they got sick, and they nearly died, and they were carried for hundreds of miles on stretchers. And eventually, Speak goes temporarily blind. Uh, Burton is almost blind, and they finally crest this hill and look down on Lake Tanganyika. And Speak can't see it at all. Burton can barely see it, um, but it turns out it's Lake Tanganyika, one of the largest lakes in Africa. It's not the source of the Nile, although Burton thought it was. Anyway, so they're nearly dead. They've reached this far inland sea, and Burton um, is a little worse off than Speak, and John Speak gets better sooner, and he says, you know, I'm kind of bored. I thought I'd just travel north a few days. I've heard of another lake. And so Burton says, go ahead, and Speak goes up, and 16 days later, he discovers Lake Victoria and names it and comes back. He's there for, for two days, just on the bottom southeast tip of Lake Victoria, comes back and tells Burton, I found the source of the Nile. Burton, who knows 29 languages and has read everything there is to read about the geography of Africa, says, how can you possibly know that? Speak says, I'm just sure I'm right. So. They get back to the coast and speaks a little healthier than Burton. He goes back to England first, and as he leaves, he says, I promise I won't say anything to the Royal Geographic Society until you get back. The minute he gets back to England, he goes straight to the Royal Geographic Society and declares that he's discovered the source of the Nile. <laughs> Here's Burton, one of the greatest geniuses in history, who's now been edged out by this guy who, <laughs> who only knows English and knows nothing of the history of this exploration. So they get into this celebrated dispute, and it ends in a really interesting way. People can come and, and to the... Oh, there you go. That, that wasn't meant to be a teaser, but, gonna, yeah. but this, this man, Sir Richard Francis Burton, is, is just far and away the most interesting personage that I have ever encountered in my whole life. And the more you read about him, the more deeply fascinated you get. So I'll give you a couple of books on Burton, and well, I know you. by then you'll be by the eleventh of March. Yeah, you got okay. a couple of All weeks. Right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. So we will. That will be the topic on the eleventh of March, and uh, we certainly look forward to as many of you that can make it making it. We New appreciate Arabic. that. You could pass in Arabic. I think you told us that. I know, but just think <laughs> of that. I mean, have you ever met anyone in your life who spoke a foreign language sufficiently to pass? To pass. Yeah. Without when it's accent. death, if you're caught. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so the 11th of March. Okay, good. All right, 11th of March, we do that. Now, you wanted to start tonight, so do you want to set this piece up? Well, let me just start by saying that um, Eric Severide, is, as everyone knows, a North Dakotan, and I've been thinking a lot about Severide because you know the, the little film that David Swenson and I made of about Art Link. Well, our, our second and third documentaries are going to be about former Governor William Guy, where that's an ongoing project, and also about Eric Severide. And so I've been thinking a lot about Severide lately, and so we're starting to gather um, archival tape from his commentaries and his radio work. And I thought we could just start tonight to put everyone okay. in the mood. Some of, I, when looking out, I think some of you remember Eric Severide from CBS Evening News. His last commentary, he, he was a commentator for Walter Cronkite between 1963 and 1977, and he retired. And his last commentary was this one in 1977. I thought we could just play it to, to put people in the mood. 
By my time of life, one has accumulated more allegiances and moral depths than the mind can remember or the heart contain. So I cannot enumerate my betters, my mentors and sustainers during so many years of trying to use with sense this communications instrument as unperfected as the persons who use it. But they know that I know who they are. Many are gone, including the man who invented me at Murrow. Some died in the wars we were reporting. I've gone the normal span of a man's working life, rather abnormal in this calling, and it's a happy surprise. We were like a young band of brothers in those early radio days with Murrow. If my affections are not easily given, neither are they easily withdrawn. I have remained through it all with CBS News, and if it is regarded as old-fashioned to feel loyally to an organization, so be it. Mine has been here an unelected, unlicensed, uncodified office and function. The rules are self-imposed. These were a few. Not to underestimate the intelligence of the audience and not to overestimate its information. To elucidate when one can more than to advocate. To remember always that the public is only people and people only persons, no two alike. To retain the courage of one's doubts as well as one's convictions in this world of dangerously passionate certainties. To comfort oneself in times of error with the knowledge that the saving grace of the press, print, or broadcast is its self-correcting nature. And remember that ignorant and biased reporting has its counterpart in ignorant and biased reading and listening. We do not speak into an intellectual or emotional void. One's influence cannot be measured. History provides for the journalist no markers or milestones, but he is allowed to take his memories. And one can understand as he looks back the purpose of the effort and why it must be done. A friend and teacher, the late Walter Lippmann, described the role of the professional reporter and observer of the news in this manner. We make it our business, he said, to find out what is going on under the surface and beyond the horizon, to infer, to deduce, to imagine, and to guess what is going on inside, and what this meant yesterday and what it could mean tomorrow. In this way, we do what every sovereign citizen is supposed to do, but has not the time or the interest to do it for himself. This is our job. It is no mean calling, and we have a right to be proud of it and to be glad that it is our work. In the end, of course, it is not one's employers or colleagues that sustain one quite so much as the listening public when it be so minded. And I have found that it applies only one consistent test, not agreement with one on substance, but the perception of honesty and fair intent. There is in the American people a tough, undiminished instinct for what is fair. Rightly or wrongly, I have the feeling that I have passed that test. I shall wear this like a medal. Millions have listened intently and indifferently, in agreement and in powerful disagreement. Tens of thousands have written their thoughts to me. I will feel always that I stand in their midst. This was Eric Severide in Washington. Thank you and goodbye. Eric's not retiring from television entirely, but only from daily journalism, and that means, of course, this broadcast. It's not only his beautifully chosen words of wisdom that we shall miss. To this newsman, he's one of the finest essayists of the century. But we shall also miss our almost daily contacts with him in the pursuit of our craft, in which his rare insight and unswerving integrity were a constant source of professional guidance. And yes, it's also true that we shall be the poorer in our self-esteem for no longer being able to call him colleague. But that's the way it is. Wednesday, November 30th, 1977. The Supporter Crime Guide, CBS News. Good night. Remember those days, huh? Uh, the first thing that you think of when you see this is he couldn't, he couldn't survive 10 minutes today. I mean, he was, he was uh, thoughtful. He was um, a little formal, at times a little pompous. Uh, he was, um, he used a large vocabulary. Um, he, there, there was a kind of an earnestness bordering sometimes on sternness in his manner. I mean, when's the last time on television, on cable, on any form of television that you've seen a commentator who day by day strained to be as serious as Severide was and to be as thoughtful as Eric Severide was? I mean, it, it, it really, he was unique in his own time and he's, in a sense, the more so as we look back from whatever it is we're at today. Can we just shut that off? It's going to be distracting, I think. Uh, you can just push X, sure. I think. Sure. Or you can just close the cover. What, what, uh, no, that won't work either. Um, <laughs>
Here we go. There. Did that turn it off? But we, we're not going to get the screen. Well. One more time. One more X. Now will we get screensaver? Or? No, we're good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there. <coughs> I think maybe right there. We okay? Well, so far. Okay. It's a blue screen. All right. It's nice. Let's, uh, yeah. Our, 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 the next clip we're going to play is a radio broadcast. We'll do right. that here in a little bit, right. and so we won't even have to worry about I suppose we could put the screen up then. Well, no, we'll, we're okay. Well, we'll see. Okay, we're all right. Yeah. Okay. Um, I know we're going to talk about Eric Severide a lot tonight, but uh, he did mention in there that he was a product of, of Edward Morrow. So why don't we begin tonight with a conversation about who the Morrow boys are, who was Edward R. Morrow, than who the moral boys are, because Eric Severide was one of those, famously one of those. And, and you heard him, he said, Murrow invented me. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a pretty strong statement. He was the greatest of the Murrow boys. Uh, he's the one who made the transition from radio to television most effectively. He had the longest staying power in media of all of them. Edward R. Murrow, they're all contemporaries. Edward R. Murrow, 1908 to 1965. Uh, Eric Severide, 1912 to 1992 and William L. Shirer, 1904 to 1993. They're all from sort of marginal uh, social and economic backgrounds. Eric Severide, as everybody knows, grew up in Velva, North Dakota. Uh, his father went bankrupt w uh, when Eric was 12. They left Velva, his father was a farmer and a banker. They left Velva and moved first to Minot and then to Minneapolis and Severide virtually never came back for the rest of his life. And in the handout that you have, uh, there is a kind of a famous passage from Eric Severide. Let me just quickly read it because it, I think it's one of the most interesting passages ever written about North Dakota. But this is from his, his autobiography, Not So Wild a Dream, which I think is without doubt the best autobiography ever written in, by a North Dakotan. It's an extraordinary piece of work, and if you haven't had a chance to read it, I really strongly urge you to do so, particularly the first few chapters. And what's interesting about his autobiography, Larry, is that he wrote it in 1946, and it's really the first half of what everyone assumed would be a two-volume memoir. He never wrote the second one. So in a sense, the second volume is the accumulated scripts and commentaries and other essays that he wrote. He was very widely published, but he never, for, for whatever reason, he never later in his life went back and tried to review the second half of his life, which is a real gap, unfortunately. We would all be better off if he had done it. But So the, the autobiography, Not So Wild a Dream, goes from 1912 to just after World War II, and it, it belongs to a genre of World War II memoirs written by this, this club of reporters and broadcasters that are sort of loosely known as the Murrow Boys. But here's what he says famously of North Dakota. North Dakota, why have I not returned for so many years? Why have so few from those prairies ever returned? Where is its written chapter in the long and varied American story? In distant cities, when someone would ask, where are you from? And I would answer, North Dakota. They would merely nod politely and change the subject having no point of common reference. They knew no one else from there. This is, of course, the most famous sentence. It was a large, rectangular, blank spot in the nation's mind. I was that kind of child who relates reality to books, and in the books I found so little about my native region, and the geography among the pictures of Chicago's skyline, Florida's palms, and the redwoods of California, there was one small snapshot of North Dakota. It showed a waving wheat field. I could see that simply by turning my head to the sixth grade window. Uh, was that all there was, all we had? Perhaps the feeling had been communicated from my mother, but very early I acquired a sense of having no identity in the world, of inhabiting by some cruel mistake an outland, a lost and forgotten place upon the far horizon of my country. Sometimes when galloping a barebacked horse across the prairies in pursuit of some neighbor's straying cattle, I had for a moment a sharp sense of the prairie's beauty, but it always died quickly away 
and the unattainable places of the books were again more beautiful, more real. That's a pretty stark statement, but you know, there are a lot of people, some of them in this room, you know, can relate to this, the sense, this, the sense North Dakotans have of being in an isolated place, of being out of the world's arena, of being sort of a forgotten backwater. And, and Severide said it better than anybody else, but it's a very common experience. And what his point, one of his points in Not So Wild a Dream is that North Dakota raises young people who leave and then really never come back. And he seldom came back. And which we did, still he, talk about today. Which we do, yeah. yeah. It's a, so it's a very interesting statement. And, and I think that one thing I'd like to do, Not So Wild a Dream is a hard book. It's a long book. Um, and it, a lot of it's about the war and the University of Minnesota and so on. Fascinating, and I highly recommend it. But I think the first couple of chapters should be printed separately because it's one of the most interesting texts that North Dakotans can sort of wrestle with about who we are and what our identity is and how we fit into the larger scheme of things. And if we have time later, I'll read a couple more passages. At any rate, so Edward R. Murrow is from North Carolina. He grew up in a log cabin without running water and without electricity. Uh, William Shirer is from, um, he was originally from, was from Chicago, but his father died when he was a boy and his mother moved to Cedar Rapids, Iowa, which he just found absolutely stultifying. If if Severide found North Dakota to be blank, Shirer found Iowa to be sort of Sinclair Lewis's main street, just claustrophobic and soul-destroying. And he later said that he went to Europe so he could finally buy a drink without having to look over his shoulder. So, you know, all three of them come from very marginal places and from marginal economic backgrounds, which I think is a key to this because they all wound up in Europe in the 1930s. And at that time, radio was new and it was very suspect. It was looked down upon by print journalists as sort of some newfangled, watered down, uh, kind of gimmicky thing that no serious journalist would do. And these three went on to become amongst the most extraordinary reporters of the mid-century. Yeah, but they all came from this sort of, this sort of strange background. So again, Severide 1912 to 1992, Shira 1904 to 1993, and Murrow from North Carolina 1908 to 1965. Before we take off into the broadcast, and I know we want to get in that and talk about World War II and stuff like that, but William Shirer, Shirer, yes. Shirer um, <laughs> uh, most folks know that you portray um, Thomas Jefferson and Theodore Roosevelt, but you also do Shirer, don't you? Not very often. Um, but you I, have. I did do, I, I worked up the character of William Shirer for Chautauqua out in Nevada one year because it was a World War II Chautauqua and I had, I had to choose a character and so I took on Shirer be, for one reason. My father, uh, who's, um, who's been deceased now for 14 years, my father was a banker in Dickinson and he was an intellectual. He was a very, very, very serious reader, much more serious than I am. And he, he loved more than any other book um, of nonfiction, Shirer's The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich. When I was like nine years old, my father was saying, well, you should read The Rise and Fall of the Third <laughs> Reich, as I, which is a kind of an odd thing to ask your son to do, but I did. And, and he read it every year and he loved it. And he read the Berlin Diaries. And so I decided I would take on the character of Shirer. So when I did this, I knew about the rise and fall of the Third Reich. Um, I hadn't ever at that time read the Berlin Diaries, and when I did, I was just, Larry, I was blown away by them. Shirer, I could just quickly tell some stories about Shirer, and then we'll get back to this, mm -hmm. but Shirer, in some ways, is the most interesting of all three of them. I mean, Murrow's the most famous, the Murrow boys, and if you've seen the film Good Night and Good Luck, you know, he's, he's sort of the, the cult figure in the history of broadcasting. And he was an extraordinary man, and he recruited both Shirer and Severide and a number of others. But he was, in a sense, the least interesting of the three. Uh, he didn't publish anything. Both Shirer and Severide were very gifted writers. And maybe Shirer maybe most of all. So he's, he's living in, in, um, in Berlin between 1934 and 1940, and he kept a secret diary. And 
when, when he, he, he married an Austrian woman named Tess, and when he left the country, it finally it got to the point after Poland that the censors were so severe that he couldn't really broadcast anything that had any value, and so he decided he had to get out. So he and Tess left Germany, and he had this diary, and if the, if the Nazis had found the diary in his luggage, he would certainly have been arrested, and who knows how much worse. So he, he buried it in the bottom of his luggage, and then he put a couple of little essays that he had written on top, thinking this, the Nazis are so stupid that they'll find these things on top and they'll kind of browbeat me over it, but they won't bother them to look at the bottom of the luggage. So he does this, and, and it, it unfolded exactly as he had hoped, and he's able to smuggle the Berlin diary out of Germany. So he comes back to the United States and he can't find a publisher for it because the publishers are all isolationists who think these reporters are exaggerating how bad Hitler is. So finally he finds a publisher and it's published in 1941, becomes a bestseller. Uh, then, anyway, he goes, he goes on to have this distinguished career and then he gets blacklisted in the 1950s as being too liberal, too leftist. And between, he got fired from CBS in a famous incident, and he and Murrow became enemies and never made up for the rest of their lives. This was in 1947. And for this period of time between, say, 1950 and 1959, William L. Shirer can't, literally can't find employment. He, CBS has let him go. Nobody else will hire him. He's in this, this list of suspect American journalists, and so he can't get work, so he goes on the lecture circuit and his savings are drawn down, and he has two children and so on. It's just a horrible thing. And finally, he's at wit's end. And so around 1956, he knows German, he knows four languages, he knows four languages including German. He says, well, you know, the Ger because the war ended so abruptly, all the German records were captured intact, that the Nazis didn't have time to destroy their records. And so all those records wound up at the Library of Congress. And so he thinks, maybe just to do something, I'll go up and look at some of those documents. And so he goes up to Washington and he, he, he literally read 200,000 German documents. And he wrote this immense book, The Rise and Fall of the Third Reich, which is about 1,100 pages long. It's half the length of the original manuscript. The original manuscript was over 2,000 pages long. Nobody would publish it, so they hacked it down to the current <laughs> immense size. And he had to borrow $10,000 in the last year of working on this project because he was completely destitute. And then he sends the manuscript off to Knopf, and they publish it, and it became an international bestseller. 20 um, printings in the first year alone and is, it's still regarded, even in the early 21st century, as the best mm -hmm. one-volume account of Hitler and the Third Reich. So think of that. He was that close to just throwing it all up and becoming a, a plumber or you know, a carpenter or something, and he puts together this book that's still regarded as an amazing account of um, Hitler's Germany. So in the course of his life, he wrote those two, plus a three-volume autobiography the middle volume of which, The Nightmare Years, 1930 to 1940, is one of the single most gripping books you will ever read if you want to, to know what Europe looked like in the period to the run-up of World War II. So this is a, a really interesting guy, William Shirer. So this is why you selected him to portray him? And I did it because of my dad, but, <laughs> but then let me just read this one passage because this will, there's this story I'll tell. So to, he was doing it for Chautauqua. And one of the stories that Shirer tells is that he, he went to Nuremberg, not for the trials, but before the war, he went to one of the Nazi rallies that had been created by Albert Speer. And he said, you know, I've read Mein Kampf, which is a, an idiotic book. It's just a tissue of insanity. And I know that Hitler is just a gangster and a fool, and he said, you know, mentally, I'm completely immune to this clown. But he said, as I sat there listening to Hitler at Nuremberg, I found myself getting swept up by his hypnotism. 
That is, that's how great Hitler's charisma was. So here's a passage from this, from Nuremberg. It was the eyes that dominated the otherwise common face. They were hypnotic, piercing, penetrating. As far as I could tell, they were light blue, but the color was not the thing you noticed. What hit you at once was their power. They stared at you. They stared through you. They seemed to immobilize the person on whom they were directed, frightening some and fascinating others, especially women, but dominating them in any case. They reminded me of paintings I had seen of the Medusa, whose stare was said to turn men into stone or reduce them to impotence. All through the days at Nuremberg, I would observe hardened old party leaders who had spent years in the company of Hitler freeze as he paused to talk to one or the other of them, hypnotized by his penetrating glare. I thought at first that only Germans reacted in this manner, but one day at a reception for foreign diplomats, I noticed one envoy after another apparently succumbing to the famous eyes. Martha Dodd, the vivacious young daughter of the American ambassador, has told me a day or, had told me a day or two before I left Nuremberg to watch out for Hitler's eyes. They are unforgettable, she said. They overwhelm you. His oratory also was overwhelming, at least to Germans. It held them spellbound. At Nuremberg, I grasped for the first time that it was Hitler's eloquence, his astonishing ability to move a German audience by speech, that more than anything else had swept him from oblivion to power as dictator and seemed likely to keep him there. Uh, amazing writer, but honestly admitting that he too was sort of pulled into this Swept charisma. Hitler. So okay. this is a great book. And Shirer was recruited by Murrow. So Murrow is sent to, by CBS, he, he's CBS's, um, he's, an ont, he's an empresario, he's sent to Europe, and at that time there was no broadcast news. And Murrow is sent to Europe, and his job, Larry, is, is to line up choirs and singers and lecturers who will lecture for CBS. And so he would go to Bertrand Russell, the philosopher in England, and say, would you give a lecture for CBS? And he would go to the Vienna Boys Choir and arrange for them to be broadcast. So this was his whole job. It had nothing to do with news, nothing to do with reporting. Murrow was in Europe to be a sort of a producer to line up these extraordinary events that CBS would offer to all of their affiliates. And he, Murrow, senses that war is coming. So he then recruits Shirer, and a little later he recruits Severide and then a whole bunch of others known as the Murrow Boys, one woman, Mary Marvin Breckenridge. And they then, when the, when the war comes, CBS is uniquely in the position to be able to report the war. But the thing that, the, here's where we get to the invention of broadcast news. None of them could convince Bill Paley at CBS or anyone in the CBS corporate structure that they should be allowed to report. CBS still wanted them just to do this lining up of entertainment. And so what happened finally was that the Anschluss occurred on March 11th, 1938. On March 11th, 1938, Hitler annexed Austria sent troops in, the Austrian government collapsed, and the Nazis annexed Hitler's native Austria, and Scheirer was there in Vienna when this occurred. And he decided that whatever CBS thought, he was going to go to a broadcasting house and broadcast the first eyewitness account of the Anschluss. So he goes to a broadcasting house and the Nazis won't let him do it. So he calls Edward R. Murrow in London and says, you know, how frustrated he is, and Murrow said, fly immediately to London and report this. And so, in a very moving account in this book, Shirer talks about doing that. He couldn't get a flight to London because all of the Jews of Austria were trying to get out. And so all the planes are just a sea of, you know, people desperate to leave. And so he has to fly to Berlin and then to Holland and eventually takes him 17 hours to get to London where he goes immediately to the BBC Broadcasting House. And then they, they demand that CBS take the feed and, they, and then he broadcasts the first eyewitness account of the Anschluss. And so then, at that point, Paul White and Bill Paley of CBS called him back. Meanwhile, Murrow has gone off to, 
to Vienna to replace Shira there. So Bill Paley and, and Paul White call Shira in London and say, okay, you've been begging for this for most of a year. Can you line up a round robin report for half an hour tonight? They said this at Sunday at noon. Can you line up a round robin report for tonight of 30 minutes from different European capitals, Rome, Vienna, Berlin, Paris, of European response to the Nazi aggression in Austria? And without even thinking about it, remember this had never happened. And this is going to be live. It's going to be live. And this had never happened in the history of broadcasting. And without even thinking about it, Shira responded, yes, we'll do it. And then he hung up the phone and thought, oh my God, how are we going to do this? You know, today, it would be virtually impossible to do in eight hours if you had never done it before. But the technology then was almost unbearably primitive. They literally cobbled this thing together like a Rube Goldberg invention so that somebody in Berlin would do short wave to somebody in London who would do long wave to New York and land lines, and it was all cobbled together through a series of highly fragile and uncertain radio and telephone technologies. And so they line all these people up. And that night at 1 a.m. London time, Bob Trout, who was the only CBS newscaster in the world, in New York, said, and tonight, instead of going to our normal programming, we have a round-robin report from Europe. I now take you to Bill Shirer in London. And when he said that, he had no idea that there was a Bill Shirer in London. I mean, literally, that he had no idea that anything would happen. And so Shirer comes on. Unfortunately, so far as I know, there is not a recording, of, unfortunately, of this moment. But Shira comes on, and he's, he starts by, he's lined up a, a British Labour MP, um, a woman who's come in f to London to be in his broadcast at 1 a.m. on a, now it's Monday. He has these people scattered around. So let me just give you the names of the people who were in this sort of historically important first broadcast. So Shira's in London. He starts off by saying, this is Bill Shira in London. And he says, he predicts that the British will protest but not declare war turns out to be right. Then he says, he, he interviews um, Labor MP Ellen Wilkinson for a while. Then they go to Paris, where a reporter they've lined up, Edgar Ansel Maurer of the Chicago Daily News, tells the reaction from Paris by phone, short wave, long wave. Then they go to Berlin, where another reporter, Pierre Huss of the International News Service, gives his reaction from Berlin. Then they go back to Washington, D.C., where Senator Louis um, Schwellenbach responds for the United States. Then they go to Rome. The Rome reporter, Frank Gervasi, was unable to get a phone link or shortwave or anything, so he called in his um, report earlier, and it was transcribed, and Shira read it for him and said, unfortunately, our link to Rome has failed, but I'll read you what his report is. Then they went to Vienna, Edward R. Murrow, where Murrow gave the first ever for him of on-the-scene news reports of the reaction in Austria of the Anschluss. And then at the end, Shira wraps it up. It came off without a flaw in 30 minutes. And then Shira says, as if it were routine, he says, and now I take you back to Bob Trout in New York. <laughs> and they've, they've done this thing. And this was, I mean, it's hard to exaggerate the importance of this. This was the first correspondent-based, round-table, round-robin news broadcast in the history of the world. They just cobbled it together. Mm -hmm. So then <laughs> Bill Paley's on the phone right after that to um, um, William L. Shirer, and, and Shirer picks up the phone, totally exhausted. And Paley says, great, can you do it again tomorrow? <laughs> And at that moment, the news that we all know, if you see Katie Couric saying, and now a report from Larry Scogan in Rome, we use the same structure today that they invented in this kind of crazy, last second, technologically challenged way on March 13, 1938. Absolutely invented on the fly. Never done Never. before. 
yep. invented on the fly, and they, they had from noon until night to put this thing together. And they did it, and it came off flawlessly. And at that moment, the world changed forever. And suddenly, these guys that were regarded as sort of circus acts, you know, marginal radio guys lining up Bertrand Russell for a little talk, suddenly they are the most interesting thing that's ever happened in modern journalism. And that leads to, everyone remembers, Edward R. Murrow on the rooftop during the Blitz. Um, you know, he had, this, he had two famous cliches. He'd start off always by saying, this is London. And his speech teacher back at Washington State in Pullman had taught him to pause between this and is London. And then at the end of his broadcast, he would say, good night and good luck. That's Murrow. He became famous for doing that. Shirer stayed on until 1940. He became um, extremely um, famous, in a way more than Murrow during that period. Severide is the latecomer to this. He isn't recruited for another year until August of 1939 by Murrow, but then um, Severide, who has a, you saw him, he has a, he has a terribly nervous man, even as late as 1977. He was never fitted for broadcast. When Walter Cronkite says he's one of the great essayists of the 20th century, he's right. But, but Severide was a very uncertain broadcast personality, both on radio and on television. And he shook so much that he had to gr grasp his hands. He often broke out in hives. He often wore gloves. And there were long gulps and pauses, and he couldn't get air. And he was nervous all of his life. He was the last man who should have been a broadcaster, but he did it. And he, too, became famous. And so the three of them were really the core of the Murrow boys. And all three of them went on to have distinguished careers. Shirer as a broadcaster and as a writer. Severide, you know, and, and uh, Edward R. Murrow came back and did See It Now, which was the sort of the precursor of 60 Minutes and the program that eventually helped to bring down uh, McCarthy from Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. So this was this great moment. Uh, speaking of Eric uh, being very nervous in front of the, uh, well, the camera or the microphone, period. Um, let's talk a little bit about him trying to overcome his fears uh, in what you had me read for this night. Everything I know about this, Clay had me read tonight, for tonight, you I always should say, say over the thing. last couple of weeks. Yeah. But at any rate, um, I, I'm amazed by his constant battle with fear and then flying the hump in India and all that sort of stuff. So you want to talk a little bit about that and how well, he overcame that? You know? In a way, Murrow is the bravest of the three. I mean, he, he not only got himself up on the rooftop, the BBC did not want him to be doing those, B, those rooftop broadcasts because they were afraid that he would just sort of teach the Germans where to place the bombs. And so when they first allowed him to do it, they put him on a building two blocks away so that if that building got it, at least BBC's headquarters <laughs> wouldn't get it. So, I mean, he's, he's a fearless man, and he's up on these rooftops, and he's reporting, and the bombs are coming down. Some of you will remember this. And, and, you know, extraordinary. And then he went on, I think it's 25 bombing missions over Germany. And I can read one if you like at another point, but he, he would go on these bombing missions because he felt he had to, that you know, he had to, to participate. So he's the bravest of the three. Severide was always a very timid guy. And he tells the story of walking down the streets of London with Murrow, and there'd be bombs raining down, and Severide would hit the deck. I mean, he would throw himself down on the sidewalk in fear, and then he'd look up, and there'd be Murrow just continuing to walk. And he'd feel so ashamed that he, he forced himself to be braver than he actually was. But he left London because he couldn't take the fear, and he came back to the United States. And when he came back to the United States, this is 1940, so he's only really there for a few months as a sidekick to Murrow. When we came back to the U.S., he felt like a failure. I mean, um, Severide was a very complex man and a self, um, a, a kind of a self-evaluating man, and, and in some ways a sort of a self-disappointed man all of his life. 
very hard on himself. And he came back to the United States and he thought he'd come back in shame because he'd left the, the scene of action. When he got back to New York, he found out that he was a national hero. That people had heard him and they loved what he said because he was such a gifted writer. So then he decided that he, 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 did, he did sign up for the draft, but he wasn't drafted and he was in the United States from 1940 to 1940. Four, and then he decided he'd go back in time to be part, you know, to report on the war. And he was actually in Italy during the Italian campaign and in Africa. And he, did, and, he was, and, he, and he saw some action then, but he was really f terrified through that whole period. And during, in 1943, he was sent by CBS to China, and he was flying in a C-40 transport plane that was still kind of an experimental cargo plane, and the plane went down over Burma in the Himalayans. And he says in his autobiography that he actually had a debate with himself whether just to die when the plane went down or to take the risk of jumping out in a parachute. But that's how terrified he was. And so he parachutes out. And they, they parachute right into this tribe of headhunters. And so he, but he found some bravery then. And he actually became a leader of these, this group of, I think, 17 survivors from this crash. And then they, they do a 120-mile hike out of this of the Himalayans, and uh, you know, he, he, so he, he was a man who forced himself to be brave, but he was never a natural the way Edward R. Murrow was. It was he, he always had this sense of fear and self-loathing that followed him through his whole life. So it, it's amazing that he accomplished as much as he did, given all of that. And he and he attributes a lot of it to the canoe trip. You know that when he was when he graduated from high school at Minneapolis uh, High School, he went on a 2,250-mile canoe trip from, most people know this from his book, Canoeing with the Cree, but he went from St. Paul, Minnesota, up the Minnesota River to its source at Lake Traverse, and then there's a little portage there, and then he and this friend, Walter Port, canoed down the source waters of the Red all the way to Winnipeg and eventually up to York Factory, a distance of 2,300 miles almost. And they nearly died a couple of times. And here's what he says about it in Not So Wild a Dream. I knew instinctively that they really, they ran out of food and they ran out of season and they ran out of soul. They had, a, they had several really hair-raising experiences. He said, I knew instinctively that if I gave up no matter what the justification, it would become easier forever afterwards to justify compromise with any achievement. So he forced himself to be brave all of his life. Mm -hmm. And I, Porter was his traveling companion. There, he draws an analogy between Porter and it's Moore. Port, yeah, Walter Port. Because of the, that they were the... The, the they brave were, ones. Yeah, they were the brave ones, and so he was always forcing himself. I, I, I do want to take a minute and tell the story about, because from an Air Force, I'm an Air Force guy, and from this perspective, this is a wonderful story. They're flying in this airplane, and imagine Eric Severide sitting in this airplane, and here's a man that fears, and he's always trying to overcome his fear. He's on an airplane, flying over the mountains, and the enlisted crew chief comes running out of the cockpit, opens up the door, and starts throwing out the luggage. And Eric Severi is sitting there wondering what is going on. The next thing, some guys come out of the cockpit and start strapping on parachutes. And so he is sitting there trying to overcome all of his fears, and he knows the plane is going down. And that's when they start jumping off the plane. The only, I think the only one that died was the co-pilot who ended up riding the plane down to the ground, but everybody else had parachuted. And, uh, and then he does. He becomes the natural leader of it, doesn't he? And gets them out of there, lost a lot of his weight, and yeah, yeah. somehow he just, he, he says he, you know, somebody had to lead and there was nobody else who was going to do it. So he, uh, duty is the key in Eric Severide's life, ambition and duty. And he just forces himself forces out of a sense of duty to, to lead these men out. Yeah. It's, a great, it's a great story. So a couple of years ago, well, some people have recreated that canoe trip. I, th I think maybe you and I should. I think so. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but last year in 2008, a couple of young men from uh, Chaska, Minnesota, um, Cotton Whitty and Sean Bloomfield, recreated the entire trip in 49 days. And there's a website, and for this documentary we're going to do on them, we're going to interview them and also get footage of them 
from their recreation of the trip. It's a lot easier now. The, the, the gear is better. Mm -hmm. There's radio communication. There are maps. When Severide and Walter Port did this, north of Lake Winnipeg, it was all crazy portage country where there'd be a lake with 2,000 islands in it, and they'd have to find the, the river, and there were no maps to get them out. I mean, it's a miracle that they were even able to pull it off. And everywhere they stop, people would say, you're crazy. Don't, can't don't do try it. Yeah. Don't go any further. But you know what he says in this key passage? He says, I knew that if I quit, that, I, that, this, would be the, that this would be the pattern of my life. And so that sort of tells you a lot about Eric Severide and his mm -hmm. bravery. Mm -hmm. We're painting this picture of a kind of a, a man with some real insecurities, but that's not really a fair portrait because for 14 years, he was Walter Cronkite's principal commentator, he was in a sense the only talking head in America for that period. And if you read his commentaries, they're all preserved in the Library of Congress. He gave all his scripts to the Library of Congress. He is a very brave man. I mean, he, he said things that are extremely strong. He's, you know, he, some people regard him as sort of the conscience of America during this period, or the voice of America, or the Greek chorus of American life. But he really was the only commentator. And no matter what kind of household you grew up in, when something happened, the assassination of John Kennedy, or the assassination of Martin Luther King, or race riots, or Watergate, or the first energy crisis, you invariably turned to hear what Eric Severide had to say. And the th if, I'll read a few of these. They're really very strong and brave. There was nothing intellectually timid about Eric Severide. He was just a, f I was going to say a physical coward. That's not quite <laughs> fair, but he was, yeah. he was a physically timid man. But intellectually, I mean, his politics were, I would say his politics were center left. But today they would be regarded as leftist politics. I mean, if he were a commentator today, Sean Hannity would be assaulting him on television every day for his left-leaning views. And it's, it's kind of shocking. And I, I think Eric Severide might be the most major center-left figure ever produced by North Dakota. If he were writing a column for the Fargo Forum today, he would be denounced for mm -hmm. how progressive his views were in the 1960s. How, how did he fare uh, during the McCarthy era? He, he, was, he was brave in that respect, too. And, and one thing that, that I've discovered in reading about these three, reading this book, The Murrow Boys, by the way, is a great book. You read it. Uh, we're going to have a symposium in Bismarck in the fall. Brenna Doherty's here tonight from the North Dakota Humanities Council. And we're going to have a symposium here in November on Eric Severide. And we'll also have a scratch version of the documentary ready by then. But the keynote will be a man uh, by a man named Raymond Schroth, who's written, it's on people's handout, but he's written the standard biography of, of Eric Severide. And then um, Stanley Cloud and Lynn Olson, a husband and wife writing team, have written The Murrow Boys, which is an extremely readable book, as you know, a really great book on the invention of all of this. And they're coming too. So this will be in November here in Bismarck. But he was. Um, you know, he, he was brave about all this. And one point that, that Cloud and Olson make in the book is that you know, we associate the, um, the destruction of, of McCarthy with Edward R. Murrow's famous broadcast. It's not really fair. Murrow was a latecomer to this. Others had been much more outspoken against Joseph McCarthy sooner. And Murrow really waited until McCarthy was already kind of a spent force before he went after him in that famous episode of, of See It Now. And Severide had attacked, not attacked, but he had questioned in his usual thoughtful way McCarthy's tactics and had said that, that these were doubtfully, that this was a really, they had doubtful constitutional integrity about them. And he also, something I know a little bit more about, when J. Robert Oppenheimer's security clearance was pulled in um, June of 1954, Severide defended him and said, this is a travesty of American justice. So he was already an outspoken champion of free speech and due process and uh, the Bill of Rights during the Cold War before really Murrow got onto it. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> 
No, uh, now, do we want to go back to World War II before we start talking about what happened to all these guys? There's 11 of them, and we, you know, we, we'll want to cover some of that. But do we want to go back to World War II, and do you want to talk a little bit about, uh, I don't know, do you want to talk about any of the others? Or Collingwood seems like a really an interesting guy. And They recruited, um, you know, there were a bunch of them, Howard K. Smith and Charles Collingwood and uh, Lesur and, and a bunch of them. And, and most of them went on to have distinguished careers. Uh, one thing that Murrow had was a capacity to realize talent when he saw it. And CBS was always trying to veto his choices because Severide, as you can see, even in late in his career, was kind of a nervous broadcaster. And he had had a weak voice when he started. And Bill Shirer had an even weaker voice. The only natural amongst them was Murrow himself. And so he's constantly getting CBS to hire people that they don't want to hire because it's, it's media, and these people have weak voices, but Murrow forces it. So he recruits all these people, and he recruited a bunch of Rhodes Scholars, Howard K. Smith and Charles Collingwood amongst them. And all of them went on to have distinguished careers at CBS or other places. And they, they became, you know, once the, once the Anschluss was over, CBS sort of backed away from its roundup, and then when Hitler and next Czechoslovakia, they returned, and then they never stopped. And CBS got out ahead of NBC. ABC hadn't been invented yet. And CBS got out ahead of NBC and established a primacy in news that, it, that continued until a few years ago with the Dan Rather debacle. Dan Rather, yeah. Dan Rather by the way, was one of um, Severide's protégés. Severide and Dan Rather were in Vietnam together in the mid-60s, and Rather was just a kid. And he then felt about Severide the way Severide had felt about Murrow, and so, so they became protege and mentor. But I don't think that was reciprocated between Severide and Rather. Yeah. Severide wrote some pretty nasty letters to Rather about you're no Edward Morrow and don't <laughs> think you are. And, well, right? I think he's right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, Murrow was a was was one of those rare people that comes along once in a very long time. But mm -hmm. Rather certainly still looks up to Severide, and our hope is that we can get Dan Rather to come out for this symposium. We'll see about oh, that. Right. It'd be yeah. fun to have him, though. Yeah. Appeal to his ego is what I hear. <laughs> it might work. That'll be trying to pay him. I mean, that <laughs> you can never afford these people. There's like $75,000 a pop. Yeah. You know, that it's shocking. But there are still people alive who, who knew Severide. Daniel Shore, who didn't like him very much, he's now at NPR. Uh, Sam Donaldson, uh, Charles Osgood. Unfortunately, the great, and Walter Cronkite is still alive. I don't think his health is very good, but we're going to try to go interview this, these people. But there are still groups of the second wave, not the Murrow boys, but the second tier who are alive and worked with Eric Severide and knew him and greatly respected him. Mm -hmm. Let's talk a little bit about uh, it, this collection of folks that Murrow brought together these these eleven. Well, I guess it's ten plus Murrow. Is that right? right, or, right. Um, let's talk a little bit. I, I find it intriguing when they talk about how Murrow had this absolute need to be adored, and and these other folks had a need to be attached to someone to look up to, their insecurities. And uh, do do you find that that's across the board that that Murrow only would allow people? You know. He's arguing with CBS because they're listening to these voice tests, right. and they're saying, this guy's not a broadcaster. But Morrow somehow is seeing them as someone that can adore him, and therefore he's hiring them. Do you think, is that a fair assessment or not? I'd, I'd say it is and it isn't, Larry. I mean, in the, it is true that you know, Shira's dad died when he was a boy, and then he, he, in another one of those great coincidences, I mean, Shira's life is filled with these coincidences. I'll just give, give you, two quick stories of this. He goes, he, he graduates from Coe College in 1925. Coe is in Cedar Rapids, and he hated Coe College. And the president of Coe College, when, when Shira graduated, said, I know you are ambitious. I'm going to give you a $100 bill, because I know you want to go to Europe. And so um, Shira goes to Europe on a cattle freighter from Labrador. He actually has to tend cattle to get across the Atlantic, and he gets to Paris, and Paris, it's the Paris of everyone's dreams. It's the Paris of Fitzgerald, and the Paris of Hemingway, and Charles Lindbergh comes 
in his famous flight while he's there. And uh, you know, he just meets the most extraordinary people. The, the, it's, it's Hemingway and James Joyce, and it's just a, it's an extraordinary time. And he, he applies to all of the Paris newspapers for jobs. And of course, they all say, kid, we get 50 applications like yours per day. And so he spends a couple of um, weeks in Paris with a friend of his, and he doesn't get any feelers for a job. And so on the last night before he has to go back, his money has run out. On the last night, he and his friend from Iowa go out, and they get just extraordinarily drunk and stay out all night in Paris. And the train is leaving like at 8 AM. And at 6 AM, they stagger back to their room drunk to pack and get ready to take the train in ignominy back to, um, to the port and then they'll you know, get a freighter back to the United States and come home in failure. And they stagger into this room that they've rented and they're so drunk that Shira doesn't see an envelope that's been stuck under the door. So an hour later they're trying to clear their heads and get out of town and he opens up the envelope and it's from the the Herald, the International Herald, and it says, if you want a job, get here by 5 p.m. And so <laughs> he, the day he's about to leave, he gets a job. So he goes off to the newspaper, and he's, he's given this job as kind of a low-end copy boy. And he sits down, and the guy across from him re reaches over and says, hey, Jim Thurber. And he, <laughs> he meets James Thurber, and he, he meets everybody. I mean, he... He's in Paris at one of the greatest times of the 20th century, and he gets to do everything, including cover Lindbergh when he lands. And it's just an extraordinarily beautiful time for him. And so then he gets fired in 1937 or early 8. And on the same day he gets fired, a telegram comes from an acquaintance of his in London saying, this is Edward R. Murrow, could I come to Berlin and meet you and we'll have lunch? And, and Murrow recruits him to be part of this CBS world he's trying to build. So twice in this early mm -hmm. period of Shira's life, he's rescued by coincidence. And he, he, has, to do a, he has to do a voice test. And, and the voice, there's a comic account of the voice test. But see, Paley's listening. He's absolutely not. We are not hiring this guy. He's awful. He squeaks. <laughs> And Murrow just insists. So your question is, what is this really about? Well, Murrow saw talent. I mean, Severide and Shira are two of the giants of the 20th century, not just as journalists, but writers and thinkers. Both of them had father issues. Uh, Shira's father literally dead. Severide's father had been a stern and emotionally detached person, and so you're saying that there's, is this some sort of a pattern in Murrow? Mm -hmm. Maybe, but I, mean, I don't, I mean, more, th more than that, he saw the talent of these guys. And because they were there at the beginning and they became the pioneers and therefore became legends in their own time. I mean, when, when Severide comes back in 1940, he's already a famous man from just a few months in the London Blitz. So these people just rocket into national celebrity at a time when there's a vacuum of this sort of thing they never forgot Murrow, and if, if Shirer and Murrow hadn't quarreled in 1947, he would have said, Murrow invented me, which he should have said. There's a long and interesting account of his struggles with Murrow in his autobiography, but I think more than the psychological aspect is this, just that Murrow saw something in them. He was a very good judge of talent, and, but he found people who also psychologically needed his charisma. Okay. Does that make any sense? Oh, absolutely. Um, as I read these accounts of these guys, they really did have that rock star appeal, it seemed to me. I mean, when they come back to the United States, these guys are making real money. Making good money. Making well, two of them, the two of the three, of the three principals, Severide and Murrow, are both extremely handsome men. I mean, at one time, Severide was, a, was like a movie star handsome, and Murrow had kind of these swarthy, brooding looks. Shire or not, he was a dumpy little guy. <laughs> but he was, interestingly enough, he was the most successful of the three with women. 
when he was asked, he said, I just, <laughs> I just try a lot harder than they do. But, <laughs> but they all were, they were celebrities, and they, they became celebrities early. And it's, you know, it's hard for us because the media is so saturated in every direction. It's hard for us to really see this. But just think back for the people in the audience of what Walter Cronkite once represented in the United States. I mean, the most trusted man in America, the most listened to person in America, also recruited by Edward R. Murrow, although later in the game. These, these people occupied the, the top of a pyramid of talent and celebrity at a time when this was still a brand new and exciting medium. Today, they would have to share with, you, know, you see people on television today and you've never even heard of them, and yet you sense that they're important. And it's a whole different world now. Mm -hmm. And so they were, they were celebrated. But remember, too, that they were there at the Blitz they were there at one of the most critical moments of world history. And when, when Murrow came back briefly in 1941, he, there was a dinner for him at the Waldorf Astoria in New York, a, a welcome home dinner. 1,100 people attended. And at the dinner, a telegram from Franklin Delano Roosevelt was read welcoming him home. And then the poet laureate of the United States, uh, Archibald MacLeish, gave a speech in which he said this to Murrow about his reporting, his, his live reports during the Blitz. He said, you burned the city of London in our houses, and we felt the flames. You laid the dead of London at our doors, and we knew that the dead were our dead, were mankind's dead, without rhetoric, without dramatics, without more emotion than needed be. You have destroyed the superstition that what is done beyond 3,000 miles of water is not really done at all. And so we have to remember that these were not just foreign correspondents at a time of world uncertainty. These were, this is the time when the, the survival of Western civilization was really in the balance. And the number one voice of this was Edward R. Murrow from those rooftops in London during the Blitz. And, and most historians see the you know more about this than I do, but the Second World War was really won on two fronts. One was during the Blitz in London and the, the Battle of Britain, and which, which caused Hitler to postpone, turns out he never got back to it, his invasion of England, and the second was Stalingrad. Those were the two things that saved the world from the Nazi menace, and, and our guys were a part of this. So they were regarded as not only as, as celebrities, but national heroes, too. And I think that's a big difference. Okay. And great competitiveness between them. I mean, th th they didn't see themselves as a team. They're all Murrow boys, but they all wanted to be, I guess, the number one Murrow boy. And uh, there are stories about Eric Severide denying the microphone to, I forget, Collingwood or whoever. Um, they've got to make these reports. And can you talk about their competitiveness? Well, there was limited airtime then. Remember, we have um, CBS, NBC, and Mutual, and that's it. And still, at that time, most of the CBS and NBC schedules were soap operas and um, comedy and The Lone Ranger, and you know, the, not very much of it was news. And so there was very limited airtime. And then, as, as now, people f fight fiercely for airtime. All of them naturally either had or developed giant egos. Um, you know, Severide, for all of his um, self-doubts, had a huge ego. Murrow was the king, and so, he, I mean, his ego was gigantic, but in a sense, he didn't have to protect himself very much. All these protégés, these sons, these surrogate sons, were fighting for his affection and his attention and for airtime, and so they, they were not above doing some unscrupulous things from time to time. But what happened was how it shook out is that Shirer washed out of the media and became a major writer instead, the best of the lot, and Cronkite, sort of lucked into his job as the anchor of CBS News. He'd had a kind of a rough beginning, but he was so genial that he sort of grew into that role. And they all resented that, that he wasn't an official early member of the club, and yet he had somehow become the primary figure. Murrow kind of marginalized himself by his righteousness and his idealism, and he eventually turned on television and became one of its critics. And then he died young of, of lung cancer um, in 1965. And so the one who really was the survival artist of all of them was Severide. And he got, 
you know, Walter Cronkite's work in the 1960s and 70s was of extraordinary national value, but Walter Cronkite was a, he was a voice. He did not report. He was really an anchor in the old sense of the term. The only time that I ever saw him, I saw twice in my lifetime, Walter Cronkite inject himself into the news. One was when he reported the death of John Kennedy. I don't know how many of you remember that, but it's one of the most I can hardly even think about it now without becoming emotional about it, but his voice broke when he announced the death of John Kennedy. And then the second time was at the 1968 Democratic Convention when Mayor Daley's police were literally beating up reporters and delegates and students and anyone they could get their hands on, and Cronkite had an outburst for the first time in his life, and he said, this is, out this is outrageous, I've never seen anything this outrageous in my life, and those are the, I mean, I'm sure there were others, but it, the only two times that come up in the books of when Cronkite lost his sort of Olympian detachment. So, so that's who he was, but he would turn three times a week at minimum, and often four and five times to Eric Severide. And he would say, and now for some perspective on this, we turn to Eric Severide, and Severide had a license which nobody else had. I mean, literally, nobody else had in major media of the time to sit back and say, well, here's what I think of the death of Martin Luther King. Here's what I think of Malcolm X. Here's, what, here's a way to think about Watergate. And if you read these commentaries, mm -hmm. um, he does not opinionate very much. It's not as if he says the way Rush Limbaugh or <laughs> Keith Oberman would. He doesn't say how we should think about it. That's not his style. In fact, he was often criticized of being sort of wishy-washy, and he was called Eric Several Sides, because <laughs> he's always weighing this and weighing that, and he's very thoughtful, and he didn't like instant analysis. He liked to step back and brood about it before he spoke. But then he would say these things, and they would be, I'm just gonna read a couple for you, sure. if I might, because they're so, they're so remarkable. Um, there's a good book of them called Eric Severide's CBS Commentary, 64 to 1977. Let me just read a couple here. This is, um, that's on Vietnam. Uh, here's on Martin Luther King. On, you know, he has to report the day these things happen. Um, many of you will remember where you were when Martin Luther King was assassinated. I was just down at the Lorraine Hotel in December in Memphis, and it's an extraordinary historical site. But here's what he says. This, you can hear, you know, in that, in that final commentary, you could hear the strengths and the weaknesses of Eric Severide. The weakness was this, his, his capacity for verbal play and puns and kind of rhetorical tricks sometimes that kind of got in the way, but he's, here's what he says. Almost surely he was the most important American of his time, of Martin Luther King, white or black. He, more than any other man, wielded the cutting edge of history for this time and place. He preached love, so hate, of course, destroyed him as it destroyed 2,000 years ago, the man whose gospel he followed, as it destroyed 20 years ago in India, the man whose strategies he adopted. Um, he says, he was not an American Negro. He was a Negro American. King grasped the white man by his shoulder, forced him to turn around and look long and hard upon his fellow black Americans. To some, the sight was frightening, to many others, the landscape of our lives look richer and full of much greater promise. Two memories will remain forever. One is the ringing voice of Martin Luther King in his last sermon, which will haunt his contemporaries and will be revived for, for the generation to come. The other is the face of his widow, frozen in pain, a Madonna carved in black marble, the deep, dark eyes seeing us all and knowing it all. America was told today that it is a great nation and has a chance to become a great human society if it will heed the voice and never forget the face. That's pretty, pretty powerful prose. Great essay, Walter Cronkite says, great essay as to happen to be a broadcaster. He was the first to call Vietnam a quagmire. Here's what he says. This, he, the whole thing on Vietnam is very interesting because it wasn't, he wasn't leading public opinion. He was, in a sense, reflecting what the people in this room were feeling. And he did it in a way that didn't push us beyond our comfort level, but constantly was kind of stretching us. 
It was an amazing achievement. So here's what he says about, this is sort of 1966 when the war is going badly. He says, but the Asian Lilliputians, you know, a little reference to Gulliver's travels, but the Asian Lilliputians in Vietnam have tied down Gulliver with a, a thousand tiny threads. He heaves and struggles and smashes back with his one free fist, his bombing power. He makes threats, offers deals, promises to turn their land into a garden with his money and skills if they will sheaf their multitude of tiny arrows and let him up. If they don't, Gulliver seems to have no recourse except to smash them all with that fist and hope this does not bring hordes of other Lilliputians to attack him. And he he's, he's, has this kind of capacity to look at these things. Here's another one. Um, the fact that this demand should, this, the demand is that um, the Johnson administration, this is during the Tet Offensive, he's, he's challenging the Johnson administration, quote, to tell the people simply and directly why we are in this war. This is 1968. The fact that this demand should still be made after three years of fighting one of the major wars of our history is eloquent proof in itself of the unprecedented moral and intellectual quagmire, he coins that term, this war represents for the country. The basic commitment for any administration is not formally stated. It is a commitment by government to its own people. It is that America's youth shall not be sent to die in wars abroad unless the security and vital interests of their country are clearly at stake and unless there is at least reasonable prospect of success. You can hear this kind of measured, he's, 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 he's feeling everyone's anxiety about the war without saying this is what we should do and this is the policy that we should follow. I mean, it's, it's an extraordinary achievement. And if you read this book, you just come away with two thoughts. One is, what an extraordinarily thoughtful man he was and what an amazing forum he got. He got to speak to America in a way that nobody does today. I mean, who would you say is the most prominent commentator in America, whoever it is? Let's just say you say it's Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> well, let's take a vote on that. Well, but I mean, this is not about your politics or our politics, but Rush Limbaugh has an audience of about 20 million. So you, you could say he's, he's the most prominent um, commentator, but he speaks to his 20 million. He doesn't speak to the nation. He speaks to a self-selected club of people who want to hear what he has to say. Severide was speaking to America. And people from every region, every state, north, south, east, west, black, white, rich people, and people of the middle classes were listening mm -hmm. to him during this period. And he was, night after night, taking the news, stepping back, trying to put it in a wider context and trying to encourage us to, um, to talk about these issues using the comments that he made as kind of a starting point. And there's a real, I think there's a real gift in that. Mm -hmm. With Cronkite and Severide, um, and I, I thought uh, watching that uh, Cronkite's tribute to Severide was a very was strong beautiful. tribute. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, Severide would say about Cronkite, he doesn't even write his own stuff. Right. He was All he does is read the teleprompter. You know? So uh, I wonder how difficult it was for Eric Severide to have this role that lasted for, what, two minutes, three times a week, and Walter Cronkite is getting all the glory, uh, you know, being the... Well, by now, Severide was such a major figure. I mean, he, Cronkite didn't write. Um, so Severide was publishing in Look Magazine and uh, Saturday Review and Saturday Evening Post, and he was widely published during this whole period. And he was regarded as a writer who happened to be a broadcaster, whereas Cronkite, for all that we revered him, was still regarded as a, a guy who was voicing the news. I don't think that he felt that. There are some, he, he, in some we know some things from his biography that he, he, they all felt that Cronkite was an upstart, that he wasn't, this was one of the problems. The Murrow boys never let anybody forget it. You know, that they were the people who had been there when the thing was invented. And they lorded it over everybody for all of their careers. And no, they were untouchables because of that. But Severide felt more authentic than Cronkite. And he felt that he was a true writer and a true reporter and that he had paid his dues in Burma and during the war. And Cronkite had been a distinguished war correspondent too, but not in quite the same sense. But there was one incident 
I just read it, read it today, where, at, you, needless to say, um, Severide's responses to the Kennedy assassination were absolutely fascinating. And he does it, he goes on for weeks afterwards assessing different parts of it. And he then at one point talked about Dallas and he, he said, he tried to defend Dallas and he said Dallas is like a lot of other places. It's sort of, it's not yet a city, but it wants to pretend to be one and it's still sort of an adolescent and adolescence always produces trouble. Hmm. And so he gave this commentary. It was quite a thoughtful commentary. When he finished, Cronkite was visibly upset. And he said, well, Eric, I think there are probably quite a few American cities that are like that. <laughs> and and Severide never forgave that. And when they got off the air, he let Cronkite have it and said, don't ever undermine me on the air again, never. And Cronkite had to eat crow <laughs> because he knew that Severide was one of the the Murrow boys, one of the yeah. aristocrats of the American broadcast industry, and that he was an untouchable. Yeah. So I think there was some tension there, but I don't think they learned to they learned to accommodate each other. Yeah. Um, when they uh, when TV, uh, I guess, was in in its infancy, and they would bring the Murrow boys together. I think once a year, wasn't it? And Edward would sit there and sort of hold court around, and they'd have cameras on all these guys, and there'd be this competition going on. I guess had quite heated debates at that time on camera uh, between these uh, huge egos that were there and all the money that they may, were making and stuff. Anyway, the, the issue I want to get into now, maybe we can chat a little bit about, is, is when television comes up. Well, actually, it started, I guess, with the radio, and that's sponsorships, the commercialization of the whole thing and how the Murrow boys felt about that and all of a sudden making these big checks and getting their time slots pulled because they might say something that would upset uh, one of the commercial interests. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, the, I mean, it's a, it's a fascinating thing because television, so these are radio guys, basically. They're inventing broadcast news on radio. One of the first things that happened to Severide when he went to London and he first met Murrow, long before he, Murrow hired him, Murrow was living in London with his wife Janet and he showed him this newfangled thing called television. Britain got television before the United States did and Murrow pointed to it and says, that's the future. And he knew that the, the television was going to just absorb radio. And so all these guys had a rough transition from radio to television. And I just watched last night, Good Night and Good Luck, and I don't know if you remember, but Murrow did a whole series of serious programs for CBS, including the most important, See It Now, but he, he also had to do junk, person to person, in which he would interview people like Liberace in their home, and I mean, it just drove him insane <laughs> that he had to earn his stripes. You know, the only way they would let him do the hard stuff on the House on american Activities Committee and about German rearmification and so on was if he would do the fluff and he would do these things and he often played it ironically. He was a master at it, but they all had to do this stuff and Severide um, did a lot of work in his life that he wasn't very proud of as an announcer because they became, and there's always, there's still this issue, you know, in television that a television personality is, is mostly a personality. Um, they are not fundamentally reporters in quite the same sense that, you know, Shirer was. And so they all bristled at this. And at this time, sponsors were more closely associated with programs than they are today. Today, you create a program and you find sponsors, but there's not a direct link. In that time, it was Wrigley Gum presents Edward R. Murrow and Kent Cigarettes presents somebody. And these companies literally paid for the program. They they paid for the production of the program and were heavily involved in it and wanted to have some editorial input. And so in 1947, Shirer has the first, he also invented the first Sunday morning television talk show. You know, the, it's a major talk show arena now. Shirer invented it and it was funded by a guy named Williams in, who did, was a soap manufacturer in Chicago. And Shirer was too liberal for his taste, so he called Paley and said, get rid of this guy. And Paley succumbed, and it's never clear quite what happened because no one will agree about this. But there was a, a crisis meeting in which Shirer either resigned in a huff or he was fired or 
both are true or neither, something happened and he never came back. And he then went to his grave arguing that Murrow had betrayed him, Murrow had become a company man, and that CBS had sold him out because his views were too liberal. CBS's view of it was and is that he had become um, complacent and that he wasn't doing very good work. But whatever it was, this company touched it off by saying this guy's too liberal. And shortly after Murrow did his famous broadcast on Joseph McCarthy, his sponsor, Alcoa Aluminum, pulled their funding. And they, they canceled See It Now, be, Paley canceled See It Now because he said, I can't, every time you do a controversial program, I can't have stomach cramps. Hmm. And they finally said, enough, enough. You, you can't, we can't be a crusading um, and controversial network. And so Murrow became bitter, and how bitter he became, he gave a famous speech late in his life at the Chicago um, Broadcasters Association, and he, he says some pretty wild things that about, um, about the media. Let me just quote a couple of passages. Um, Unless we get up off our fat surpluses and recognize that television in the main is being used to distract, delude, amuse, and insulate us, then television and those who finance it, those who look at it, and those who work at it may see a totally different picture too late. Um, he says, I am frightened by the imbalance, the constant striving to reach the largest possible audience for everything by the absence of a sustained study of the state of the nation. Then he says, more positively, this instrument can teach, it can illuminate, yes, it can even inspire, but it can do so only to the extent that humans are determined to use it to those ends, otherwise it is merely wires and lights in a box. Uh, there is a great and perhaps decisive battle to be fought against ignorance, intolerance, and indifference. This weapon of television could be useful. Paley never forgave this speech, in which he essentially says television is being wasted, but I mean, he didn't live to see reality television, did he? Um, <laughs> or American Idol, distract, delude, amuse, and insulate. Distract, delude, amuse, and insulate. And if you think about it, Larry, they had you know, three channels back then. Now we have 500, and it's, infinitely worse. And we still can't find something to watch. It's infinitely worse now. Yeah. I mean, instead of three channels distracting, insulating, and deluding us, now it's 499. Um, you can watch dating shows any time of the day or night, or wrestling. <laughs> you, can, you can watch wrestling any time of your life. I actually am a fan of professional wrestling, but... Uh, <laughs> But you see his point, that and yeah. he thought that tele he, he's an old idealist, he comes from an education background, and he thought that television should become this kind of Jeffersonian medium that would instruct us, keep us abreast of our world. Well, that's what NPR and public television are today. That's, what, that's the, the sort of the niche that they have. Mm -hmm. He was one of the first people in educational television. He was on the first educational television broadcast in New York in 1966. But, he thought television should become this extraordinary Jeffersonian tool, and instead it became that other thing. Commercialized. Commercialized, and so the, 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 the sponsors at that time had a very heavy influence on what was broadcast, and it caused Shirer to leave television, and it caused Murrow to become a bitter man. Severide has some very interesting things to say about television, which I was reading earlier today, as usual, it's Eric several sides. Mm -hmm. he, he, he sees all that's bad with television, but he continues to believe, as he had to believe. I mean, if you were Eric Severide, right, there's nobody in America who wouldn't take his job today if that person could get it. To be four nights a week speaking to the nation, he, he said, look, I mean, in a sense, he was saying he wouldn't, his ego wasn't that much out of control, but he was essentially saying, look, there's got to be something right with television because they put up with me four nights a week. <laughs> they let me do this four nights a week. Yeah. 
I want to bring up one more topic and then we'll see if there's some questions out here or something and I'd like your reaction to this. I found this whole topic incredibly depressing. Why? And the reason I did it, uh, and I guess is I, I'm, and as I was depressed by it, uh, I was reminded of something that Art Buck, Buckwald had said uh, years ago <laughs> when he talked about World War II. Yes. And that was that for those of us that survived World War II, it was the greatest time of our lives. And he stood by that uh, decades later. He was still repeating that line. And when I read about the Murrow boys, they were in the excitement, and you've talked about that. I mean, the, the big events of the world are going on around them, and they are there, and they're 30 years old, 29 years old. You know, Eric Severide comes back when he writes his biography, he's 34 years old, and you're writing a biography about the greatest events in the world, and he's writing about meeting Gertrude Stein and, and all these other great people in Europe, and he's part of this huge thing. And yet, after the war, when you read about their personal lives, they're a mess. These guys, they're alcoholics, they're... Uh, Lots of women. Lots of women all over the place. Uh, er, Severides three three marriages and and many more and many, relationships. Many mistresses. Shira I mean, three marriages. Their their personal lives are absolute messes, and none of them, except maybe Larry Lesur, none of them seem happy. <laughs> and I thought that I now remembered the Art Buckwald comment that these guys had lived so much life, and in fact. My turn to read something, if I can find it here. Good for you. Yeah. <laughs> just to prove, just to prove, I read it. Yeah. Um, just a couple of sentences here. He's talking about when he came back. This is Eric Severide talking about when he comes back from the war. I was 32, yet I had a curious feeling of age, as though I had lived through a lifetime not merely through my youth. Isn't that an amazing? And you're seeing this as depressing because now they have to live biologically 40 more years. And now they have to years. live 40 more years and they can never arrive at the excitement of their lives that they found in the war. And, and so I'm just wondering if that isn't why their lives were so screwed up. I mean, these guys had terrible personal lives. Well, they learned early on. I mean, there's something about broadcasting uh, that is, I mean, the greatness of broadcasting is that it's immediate. And back then, uh, Bill Paley at CBS did not allow any recording of sound. So today, if you listen to an NPR report, you hear all this ambient sound of metal larks or the train or, you know, the, the steel factory. All that's been recorded and then laced back in. Paley didn't allow any recorded sound, so all sound was live. So everything they did had to be live. And in the case of both Severide and Shirer, both of them had recent marriages during this critical period of the creation of the Murrow Boys. Uh, Severide's wife, Lois, whom he met, eloped with from the University of Minnesota, was pregnant with twins. And Shirer's wife, Tess, an Austrian woman, was pregnant with their first child. And both men essentially, I mean literally, abandoned their wives in the middle of this crisis to go off to fly around Europe to report. And when Severide got back from his first crisis, Lois was in the hospital in France. She was alone in a hospital because it had been deserted by everyone, including the nurses. And she was alone with two twin children in bad health in this hospital room. And Eric kind of walks in and says, hey, how are you doing? I've been inventing broadcast news. How are you doing? You know, and, and she, you know, she never really forgave that. And Tess um, Shirer, same issue. And these men were, they would, they would drop everything and leave their wives in extremity and fly around the world to report live of these events. So they were swept up in this thing. Now, their defense would be, and yeah, there are GIs dying too. I mean, this is not exactly, we're not doing this just for fun and games. We're not going to cover Cirque du Soleil. You know, we're, we're, we're in the midst of the greatest crisis of world history. But they were, 
very neglectful of their wives and families and very hard on these women and selfish, we would say just breathtakingly selfish about their careers. And this was extremely hard on, on the people around them. So fair enough. And their egos grew larger and larger and larger. And eventually Severide divorces his first wife and marries twice more. Um, Shirer has a series of mistresses. His wife finds out about it in 1970. They get a divorce. <laughs> then, you know, he's the culprit in all of this by far. So then he writes this nasty book in his last year of his life about Tolstoy's bad marriage. <laughs> Just to get to talk about bad marriage. Well, if there's any justice in the world, and he should have been pistol whipped for that. <laughs> but th these are these are hard drinking, a extremely ambitious, globe trotting. Drop everything, including your wife, who is about to die from complications of birthing her child. Tess, Shira's wife, birthed their first child, Inga Eileen, and she got phlebitis and nearly died. And he, the, the surgeons went in to fix that, and they actually left surgical instruments in her abdomen. And she had to have a second operation weeks later, and, and Shira was globetrotting through Europe during this period. And he'd come back and say, how are you holding up? So that these are not admirable husbands. You can't see them in that way. This is, I mean, if you're looking for decent human beings, you've chosen the wrong guys. <laughs> Murrow was, in some sense, the most decent of all of them, and he had several mistresses. And I suppose it, I mean, in a sense, it comes with the celebrity. It's, you know, Johnny Carson used to say this, too. You know, he'd say that, I mean, almost all Americans know me. I know almost none of them, but they see me every night in their bedrooms. They, you know, these people become inevitably, I think, gigantic egomaniacs whose celebrity goes to their head and it turns their capacity to make good judgments about their domestic lives. But you know, I don't dwell on that because, in a sense, that's the, the cost of being these guys. I, don't, I mean, I, I think they couldn't have, if they had been you know, what happens, Larry, is this happens to people all the time, that you get a chance to go on NBC News to be a commentator. If you don't drop everything and fly to New York, that's it. They're not going to call you back. So when that call comes, you get on that plane if you want to succeed. If, you're, if your child is, has a broken leg, if your wife is, has phlebitis, you get on that plane. And if you don't, then you've made your choice, and you're not going to reach that level of access. And, and this is a kind of Faustian bargain that's constantly put in front of these people. And they almost invariably, the ones that we hear about, made the choice to get on that plane. But let me just read this piece from Severide. So here's the thing I love about Severide is that, okay, he, you know, he had this problem. He wasn't an alcoholic. Whether he was a womanizer is an interesting question. He certainly he certainly had several marriages, and there are accounts of several mistresses, but we don't really know. I and mean, this is kind of a silent area in his life, but we know he had three marriages. Here's what he said right after the war. And this is why I think he's so admirable, because he did not aggrandize himself. He always knew who he was. He said, only the soldier really lives the war. The journalist does not. He may share the soldier's outward life and dangers, but he cannot share his inner life because the same moral compulsion does not bear on him. War happens inside a man. It can never be communicated. A million martyred lives leave an empty place at only one family table. That is why at bottom people can let wars happen, and that is why nations survive them and carry on. But notice he says, I'm not a hero like the GI at the Battle of the Bulge. We must never allow ourselves to think just because we were in the blitz or at this battle that somehow we are the moral equivalent of a soldier. So that's what's so admirable about him is this capacity to constantly pull back and evaluate, including himself. And he knew that his life was a mess. After he divorced Lois, who, by the way, Lois, his first wife, uh, had severe, severe manic depression and was institutionalized off and on, and I mean, you can make whatever claim you want about the dynamics of their marriage, but she was a very, very troubled person in her own right. 
But after their divorce, he felt he lived through years of the most intense uh, self-loathing for that, the breakdown of that marriage. So I don't think these were just like Casanova figures swashbuckling their way through the world. They paid a price for their centrality in American life. Okay. You're not see, buying it. No, I'm not. I'm okay. going to find a quote here. Um, but let's see if we have any questions here. We're, we're getting, running out of time. We're running out of time here. Let's see if any, bit, but, or uh, memories of Eric Severide. That would be cool. Yeah. Anyone Does have a thought? Anybody here, did anybody here know Eric Severide? Anybody? It's not surprising because he never came back. Yeah, he left at 12. Or when he, <laughs> even when he came back, he was an awful guy. He, he, he would come back, he came back about four times and he was always uh, unpleasant to be around when he came back to North Dakota. Any thoughts? Any questions or thoughts? Or yes, to, sir. Dan, I'm, you're good. For Go one. ahead. I see none. Um, <laughs> I've spent the last few weeks reading Severide now, uh, not, his, not his autobiography, which again, I really just really, really recommend for anyone who hasn't had a chance to read it. It's just so extraordinary, so literate, so thoughtful. And the chapter on North Dakota, such it's not exactly positive about North Dakota, but it really is insightful about North Dakota. But I've been reading the commentaries. And as I was reading them today, I just started marking the words that today his producers or copy readers would say. You can't say that on television. You know, words of four syllables. <laughs> um, you know, it's truly, I mean, it's, we, we, have, we have, you don't hear this anymore. I mean, the kind of the quality of his literateness is the, the sentence structure is too complex, the vocabulary is too rich, and, and, and um, it's, it's too high minded. I mean, he, he would be regarded as a stuff shirt today. He was a little bit of a stuff shirt even in his own time. But he couldn't get away with it any longer. There would be someone who said, you can't say that. That's not going to work. Our ratings will go down. Well, he was fortunate. He lived in a time when there was very little media, and you had to go through that filter. And so we sort of put up with him because you couldn't get to the other side if you didn't listen to it. But today, when there are so many choices, it's gone in a different direction. And I think television has largely given up you know, the last person who really has this kind of a reputation is Charles Osgood. And if you know much about Charles Osgood, he's sort of in the Sunday morning ghetto now, and he does a great job with it. But there was a time earlier in his life when he did all these strange poetic commentaries. He would write po poetic commentaries on everything. They were on radio. He's extremely literate. Charles, Car Charles Kuralt had some of the same qualities. But they are now regarded as sort of these rare eccentrics who are allowed to finish out their careers, but would never be allowed to come up from the base. So you don't, I don't, I don't, don't think you see this. And, and my sense is once you go down to this sort of whatever we have now, this kind of shock journalism, you can't go back. You know, because the public doesn't have the same training either. The public could hear this because it, we were still we were a much better educated public in terms of this sort of thing then than we are now. And so I don't think you could ever reinvigorate this. What do you think? I found my quote. Okay, let's hear That's it. That's what I think. Let's hear it. No, and I'm not trying to be hard on Eric Severide, but uh, you know, I, I think you know, you know a lot more about him than I do, but the, this pulling back and you know, this essay about the soldier and stuff like that, I, I think that was probably for public consumption. Oh yeah. Yeah, Eric Severide. Let's. Who this is the Murrow boys speaking? Yeah, yeah. Olson yeah. and. and yeah, yeah. After Severide's retirement, Frank Stanton took him to lunch at the Harvard Club. When they receded, Stanton noticed that Severide seemed a little more glum than usual. Is something wrong? He said. I walked through this whole room, and nobody recognized me. Severide said. Recalling that story years later, Stanton shook his head. That's a hell of a thing for a newsman to say, 
But that's what television did to those guys. Isn't that interesting? Well, I think, I mean, I, I don't disagree with that at all. They all became junkies mm -hmm. from, for celebrity and publicity. They, were, they became, I mean, what, that's what I was saying about Severide coming home. He wins the Rough Rider Award, the highest award that North Dakota can offer any native person comes back and he's arrogant about it and he stays for the shortest possible time and says nothing of any interest and then leaves the state forever. And he comes back to do the American Experience. I was watching it last night. It was done, it was a PBS program, the American Experience. And he's trying very hard to appreciate his native North Dakota. And he kind of softened up on North Dakota over the intervening years. But there's such a stiffness. He's sitting on a hill overlooking Velva. And it, you just think he, if he could have done it, he would have done it in front of a green screen and had Velva B-roll <laughs> put behind him. I mean, he just, there's, a, there's a celebrity cult that gets sprung up around these guys. Yeah. They can't help it. I mean, yep. I don't think any of them retained much humility in the course of their lives. Yeah. In, in defense of him, I guess, as a North Dakotan, I found in his biography, he starts off talking about Velva, although it's a terrible description of North Dakota, the blank spot on the map kind of thing. But in his own biography, or autobiography, I should say, the very last paragraph, he's talking about Velva again. And why? That's the key. See, this is, the question with Severide is, I mean, my question with Severide, it wouldn't be someone from Ohio's question, but my question is, to what extent is he really a North Dakotan? If you grew up here and you leave at 12 and you only come back to pick up awards, mm -hmm. are you a North Dakotan? So that, it's a really interesting question about him. So, but he writes that extraordinary chapter in Not So Wild to Dream About It. And then he ends the book by going back to Velva. And it turns out, and I'm going to read this, it's a kind of coincidence that you raised this question, because he couldn't get it out of his mind. And when the, you, know, you, you might wonder, what does Not So Wild a Dream mean as a title? The dream is kind of a Rodney King sort of a dream, can't we all get along kind of a dream. His view is, and he comes to it at the end of the, of the autobiography in 1946, he says, in a sense, if you think about it, everything is velva. I mean, everywhere in the world there are velvas. People living quiet and unremembered lives going about their business, helping out each other, struggling against conditions. He said, my experience may have been on the Great Plains, but it's really not fundamentally different from most human beings' experience, no matter what language you speak or religion you have or culture you're in. And so the dream is, can't we instill in the world community the same set of values that make Velva a successful place in spite of its being in a godforsaken wasteland. <laughs> you know, so, but, so, that, so here's one of his commentaries uh, during the, the Vietnam years. He says, we are an immature people in many minor ways. There are cancer spots of venom and panic in our system, yet when the major tests have come upon us, the world has observed that we stand steady in our shoes. It is this steadiness that leaves room for goodness. In the American hierarchy of values, it is not brilliance or strength or even success that crowns the structure, but goodness. This is the true secret of America. And if so many foreign observers miss it, it is not only because goodness does not make news, but because we do not know how to talk about it except now and then in mawkish embarrassment. That's a portrait of Velva, in the portrait of the goodness of small town life in the middle of nowhere, the end of Not So Wild a Dream comes back and says, that's the dream, that the world can be like Velva, only have a lot more interesting stuff going on too. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, he can't get it out of his system. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really interesting, I mean, the question about in what sense is Severide a North Dakotan? North he said that even though he couldn't stand to be here, he was indelibly shaped by this environment. And I do think his basic, in spite of all the things you're talking about, the arrogance, the <laughs> ego, the women, the you know, blah, 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 his basic set of values was a kind of a, a highly educated main street middle American commentator. Mm -hmm. In other words, he, he, was, he was as hard on the left as he was on the right. 
when the civil rights movement, it's the most interesting case in point, when the civil rights movement heated up, he was a very big supporter of the civil rights movement. But when the civil rights movement became militant and led to street riots and a, a kind of a, a black power period, he then became edgy about it and said, this isn't it. This isn't, this isn't what this is meant to be. I was with them when they wanted to be part of the American mix, but now that they are rejecting America and striking out against America, I can no longer support black militants. And so he was constantly arguing for this sort of, America is a land of due process and of justice and of good sense and basic virtue. And eventually that's how we're all going to live and eventually that's how the world is going to live. But he was not, he was, he was as, by the end of his life, he was reviled by the left as insufficiently progressive. Whereas when we look at him today, he looks like he maintained his progressivism throughout his life. But my point is that he was, his values are really those of a, of a very highly educated North Dakotan who, who sort of believes in America, believes in the values of this country, is disappointed when we don't live according to them, tries to give the benefit of the doubt to people in power, is, is, is reluctant to protest, but knows when he feels he's being hoodwinked. So I think that that's, that Velva never really got out of his system. Was this other radio broadcast important tonight? Apparently not. Well, we're running yeah. out of time. I just, well, can you cue it up just to listen yeah. to like two minutes of it? Because okay. I, I want people to hear just okay. the Why piece of radio. The stage here, well, right? this is, okay. wh when they, after the Anschluss was over, after the, the annexation of Austria was over, then CBS wanted to demote these guys back into their normal stuff of doing kind of entertainment roundups. And so Murrow was given this assignment to do London After Dark. And he hated it because he thought, the world is coming apart and they want us to do London After Dark. And so if you can find this, you bookmarked it, remember? I got it. Okay, if you could just play. London a, After Dark. We At this it. time, the Columbia Broadcasting System brings you a special broadcast, life in a blackout in the capital of Great Britain. During the next half hour, you will be in various parts of London, a city which had three air raid alarms today, the nerve center of empire. There will be pickups from various points in London, accounts of work, yes, and of play in this great city of a nation at war. And so we turn you over to Columbia's staff in the British capital, and we take you now to London. The hub of the British Empire in wartime seen through Canadian eyes, through English eyes, and through American eyes. London at work and at play, from the unceasing grind of England's war effort to the relaxation of the crowds of beauty. Come with us round London after dark in wartime. Sandy McPherson has led off our tour through London at the console of the theater organ in St. George's Hall, notable as the home of magic in the London of Queen Victoria's day. And now we take you into the streets of blacked out London, down stately crescent-shaped Regent Street, along Shaftesbury Avenue of theater fame, into Charing Cross Road, London's Tin Pan Alley, and so to Trafalgar Square. Waiting there is Edward Murrow, known to you as Columbia's European director. Come in, Ed Murrow. This is Trafalgar Square. The noise that you hear at the moment is the sound of the air raid siren. I'm standing here just on the steps of St. Martin's in the Fields. A searchlight just burst into action off in the distance. One single beam sweeping the sky above me now. People are walking along quite quietly. We're just at the entrance of an air raid shelter here, and I must move this cable over just a bit so people can walk in. I can see just straight away in front of me Lord Nelson on top of that big column. There's another searchlight just square behind Nelson's statue. Let you listen to the traffic and the sound of the siren for a moment. We can stop. 
Where you stop? Once and casually, a man stops in front of me to light a cigarette. Here comes one of those big red buses around the corner. Double-deckers, they are. Just a few lights on the top deck. In this blackness, it looks very much like a ship that's passing in the night, and you just see the portholes. There goes another bus. More searchlights come into action. You see them reach straight up into the sky and occasionally... You, you can listen to that if you go back to your houses and just go to um, um, Google and Google London After Dark. This will come up. It's the first hit. You can listen to the whole 30 minutes, and Eric Severide is in it. And at one point, because Paley wouldn't allow them to record ambient sound, Murrow was trying to suggest, and this, it's hard to hear this because it's so crude, but Murrow was trying to suggest that Londoners were Stoics and they were going about their business. So he took the microphone and he held it down to the ground at St. Martin's in the Fields. I've been to St. Martin's in the Fields on Trafalgar Square. He's got the microphone down here and you hear the click of the shoes. And he go, it goes on for like six minutes, you know, and you think, <laughs> whoa, you know, the pace was a little different then. And then he says, and so London goes about its business, just as any other day. People going to the theater and going to the, the shops, <laughs> and I'm now lighting a cigarette. And, and, but we laugh at this because it seems so crude, but at the time, if you remember this, this was absolutely the cutting edge. I mean, this, this was gripping, and he won awards all over the world for this because he was, it's what, uh, Archibald MacLeish said, you, you made the war come home to households in the United States. And hearing this, in a way, the crudeness makes it even more remarkable, Larry, because it's not the super produced stuff that we have today where the editors have been at work on it all afternoon. This is live, and no one knows what's going to happen. And Murrow is there at considerable risk to himself. And he then records these things, and you hear there are long pauses, and they're not sure whether the next feed is coming in, and the modulation goes up and down. But there's something authentic about it that you see, like in the Iraq War, when you have those little embedded reporters with the telephones that are basically uh, the video cameras that work through telephone lines, and you see that kind of haunted green image. That still is a very prominent part of war coverage, and Murrow invented it. I mean, he literally invented it. And so when you say, oh, well, these people all were a mess, um, <laughs> sure, but um, I had a friend who was a professor friend of mine, and he had been in World War II. He had been part of the, um, not Normandy, but uh, Battle of the Bulge, and he was one of the liberators of Berlin on the, in the American sector. And he saw lots of his fellow friends die. And he was slightly wounded, but not badly. And he, he, he came back, and he lived until 1980 seven or so, and he and I would um, have long evenings together, and he would invariably drink too much, and he would always say, I regard every day after May 1945 as a bonus day in my life. Mm -hmm. Every day that I have lived since is a free and a bonus day. And so if you think about what these guys were up against, going down in an airplane, if you and I went down in an airplane over Burma, we'd never be heard from again. <laughs> we oh, would, come on. No, I, I wouldn't be. You might be. You're an Air Force guy. But I mean, these guys saw things that you and I don't have to see. Maybe you have, because you are Air Force. But they paid a price, but they were willing to pay the price. And they went on to hold responsible jobs for the rest of their life. And so I just want you to cut them a little slack, I'll Larry. Go, go. <laughs> OK, before we come, is Brenna here? Yes. Where is she? The back. Oh, Brenna, do you know the date and location of the symposium on Murrow and broadcast news? Severide. It could, could be on campus. It could be on, we could, we could probably work that out. So the 12th, 13th, and 14th of November. And, and, and we're going to have Michael Severide, if he'll come, the son. Okay. We're going to have... Stanley Cloud and Lynn Olson, who wrote the Murrow Boys. We're going to have Raymond Schroth, who wrote the biography. We're going to try to have Dan Rather or someone of his um, celebrity. And we're going to have, then we're going to put out a call for papers. And one of the things I want to do, Larry, is have people talk about the commentator years. And I want someone to come and talk about Vietnam. And I want someone to come and talk about Watergate, and someone to come and talk about civil rights, and someone to talk about the space program. Because Severide, if you remember, was also America's voice of the space program. And 
launch after launch during the Mercury and Gemini phases, he'd be at that card table across from the launch site and he'd say, there's another delay, <laughs> this one for 12 hours. <laughs> now, to tell you how a rocket works, <laughs> and then they'd go into this kind of endless pattern to try to fill the time, but he, he was America's voice during this whole period and everything that happened to us, we filtered through him. And so I want different people to come and talk about these different okay. phases. And then someone will come and talk about his autobiography and we're gonna then have a, a lecture. It'll, I don't know who will give it yet, but it's going to be called Severide the North Dakotan. And we're gonna try to figure out sort of the question we've been wrestling with tonight about mm -hmm. is North Dakota just the place he happened to have been born or is North Dakota central somehow to understanding Eric Severide? So this will be the 12th, 13th and 14th of November right here in Bismarck. And this was, we're gonna to try to, here's one more thing we wanna do, it's so cool. Bob Edwards, you know, of um, public broadcasting, of NPR, has written this book called uh, Edward R. Murrow and the Birth of Broadcast Journalism. Of course, the NPR people, you know, claim that the Murrow boys is somehow <laughs> their natural uh, ancestors which is a little, for me, hard to take. But, uh, but at any rate, they, they have a strong feeling. So I want Bob Edwards to come, and then I'm gonna set this up so we can recreate the moment, March 13th, 1938, when broadcast news was, was established. And so I'm gonna have him at a table, maybe on the stage, and then he's going to do a live program in which correspondents call in from around the world to offer their insights about Eric Severide. It's all gonna be done unrehearsed and see if using 21st century technology he can get half as good a program <laughs> as Shirer and Murrow got with a Rube Goldberg technology in 1938. We're gonna to try to recreate that live moment of correspondence from five cities around the world calling in to tell this audience Right. Uh, who Eric Severide was and why he's important. So that's all going to be part of this. And then on Saturday night, we'll show a scratch version of this documentary that we're working on. It won't be finished, but we'll show okay. a scratch version. So I hope you'll, you'll come. Maybe it'll be here. It could be. Okay. <laughs> we'll talk, Brenna. All right. Well, thank you, Clay, very much. And thank you all for coming. Thank you. On a Friday night. The proceeding has been a presentation of Bismarck State College.